In 1965, a teenager from the United Kingdom found himself stuck in Australia and unable to afford a flight back home. With the help of two of his friends, Brian Robson decided to ship himself home in a wooden crate, but his journey would take a turn for the worse when his crate was diverted to Los Angeles. Now, 60 years later, Robson is telling the story of what happened in his book, The Crate Escape, and he's on a new mission to track down the men who helped him get home. Brian is uh, with us this morning. Tell us more about it. Good morning. Good morning, Chicago, from the UK. Yeah, good to have you with <laughs> yes, us. Yes, it was a bit of a, a bit of a feat, I suppose. Um, I was stuck in Australia, uh, 1965, and I couldn't get it home any other way because it would have been too expensive. So I decided to post myself, basically. <laughs> it's truly unbelievable that you survived five days in a wooden crate. How did you survive that? I often wondered how that actually happened, the survival bit, I mean. Um, it, it was very, very uncomfortable, and it went from freezing to boiling, lack of oxygen, uh, in and out of comas. Um, in the end, I didn't know where I was. I didn't know um, anything, quite honestly. I didn't know what day it was. Well, I just couldn't think and couldn't remember anything. I didn't even really know where I was, to be honest with you. Yeah, for some of that trip, I mean, you, were, you were upside down. Why didn't you use your emergency hammer to, to break out? Well, had I have done that when I was upside down for 22 hours, incidentally, then I'd have been exposed because I was at uh, Sydney Airport. So everybody would have seen or heard what was happening. Uh, I wouldn't have a, had a chance of getting home. So I decided to put up with the... Uh, uncomfortability and, and, and carry on with my journey. I got to tell you, I love my family not that much. <laughs> <laughs> Did you rethink that after after that? You're like, well, maybe that maybe I don't love them that much. after all, <laughs> it was actually it was a lot of things. It was family, friends, yeah, uh, racism in Australia. Uh, uh, you know, the government lied to me or lied to us as we went out there as immigrants. Uh, and as a teen, I didn't like that very much. So mm. I suppose basically I decided to get my own back. <laughs> so when you got to L.A., um, I, I read that the CIA and FBI got involved, but they didn't charge you and you ended up getting a ticket home. So wh why didn't they charge you and why did who and why did they give you a, a free ticket home? Well, uh, they were absolutely brilliant, actually. All the Americans when I was there were absolutely brilliant. Uh, why didn't they charge me? I don't think there was an offence. What was the offence? Um, I suppose uh, it could have been entering uh, America without a visa and passport, perhaps. Uh, but at the same time, they were so friendly and um, they just sort of played around with me, basically. The reason for getting a first-class ticket home was Pan American were responsible for flying me in and therefore responsible for flying me out. Uh, and so the FBI, when I was in their offices in Los Angeles, phoned up Pan American, asked them what they wanted to do, and they said, we're going to send him home. So they sent me to London. <laughs> so now you are trying to get a hold of the two guys that helped crate you up. And are these guys that were good friends of yours? You haven't been in contact with them in all these years. Or are these people that you just met? Um, yes. Uh, no, not people I just met. I'd known them for about three months, actually, uh, which was quite a long time by Australian standards. Uh, <laughs> they, were, <laughs> they were Irish, um, and uh, we became good friends within that time. When I got home, we had some codes, because we, we decided that we didn't expect to get caught, of course. I should have walked out of London and gone home. Um, and uh, uh, consequently, we, we made some codes in case. But when I did get caught, the whole thing blew up uh, worldwide uh, uh, publicity and so on. And what I've discovered since, fairly recently actually, is that they both left their accommodation without leaving a forwarding address to avoid uh, all the um, uh, newspaper reporters and so on. And by uh, using uh, your good services and other radio and TV stations, uh, I have almost located them. And I've really? certainly found out a little about them. Let's put it that way, a little more about them. Uh, and we've had about 100 emails, and we're going through them slowly to, to sort the jokers out from the, the, the actual people themselves. Uh, I think we're getting there. Well, it's it's a fascinating story. Have you been telling this story at dinner parties for years? 
No, um, it's it's actually apart from when um, some TV radio station brings it up, which they do periodically. Uh, it's not mentioned in general, oh. uh, and it was last brought up by the BBC, uh, and then the Irish Times six years later, which is now this current uh, time, brought it up, and uh, it's blown up. I mean, it's exploded literally, well, even as far as Moscow. Because oh. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing the story with us. It's called the Crate Escape. It's available now, and if you think you have any information about Paul or John, you can email Brian at brianpms at hotmail.com. Thank you, Brian. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you both. Thank you.